Even though King Henry VIII legalised the Bible in 1539, it wasn't because he had a religious awakening. Henry had approached the Pope to ask for permission to divorce his wife and marry his mistress instead. When the Pope refused to give him that permission, Henry renounced Catholicism, divorced his wife anyway and took the church out from under Rome's control. Instead he made himself the head of the church in England. This new religion, neither Roman Catholic nor truly Protestant, became known as the Anglican Church or the Church of England. King Henry now essentially acted as its Pope. Knowing that allowing the translation of the scriptures into English would rile the Pope, Henry made it his first act to do just that. He funded the first legal English Bible just for spite. The monarchs of England have been the head of the Church of England ever since. The ebb and flow of freedom continued through the 1540s and into the 1550s. After King Henry VIII, King Edward VI took the throne and after him came Queen Bloody Mary, who was a Catholic possessed in a quest to return England to the Roman Church. Under her reign in 1555, John Thomas Matthew Rogers was burned at the stake. Mary went on to do the same to hundreds of reformers for the crime of being a Protestant. Christians were forced to flee the country during this era known as the Marian Exile. They left with little hope of ever being able to return to England again. Many of these refugees ended up at the sympathetic church at Geneva, Switzerland, which became a safe haven for desperate people at this time. Led by Miles Coverdale and John Fox, as well as Thomas Sampson, John Calvin and John Knox, the reformer of the Scottish Church, the Church of Geneva determined to produce a Bible that would educate their families while they continued in exile. The result of their efforts was a new complete Bible printed in 1560 which became known as the Geneva Bible. When Queen Mary's bloody reign ended, the reformers could return to England. The Anglican Church, now under Queen Elizabeth I, reluctantly tolerated the printing and distribution of the Geneva Bibles in England. The marginal notes, which were fiercely against the institutional Church of England, did not however rest well with the rulers of the day. By the 1580s, the Roman Catholic Church saw that it had lost the battle to suppress the word of God. In 1582, the Church of Rome surrendered their fight for Latin only and decided that if the Bible was to be available in English, they would at least have an official Roman Catholic English version. And so, using the corrupt Latin Vulgate as their only source text, they went on to publish an English Bible with all the distortions and corruptions that Erasmus had revealed and warned of 75 years earlier. In 1589, Dr. William Fulke of Cambridge published the Fulke's Refutation, in which he highlighted the distortion of the Roman Church's corrupt version. After Queen Elizabeth I, King James VI of Scotland became King James I of England, and announced their desire for a translation to end all translations. What resulted was the combined effort of over 50 scholars who took into consideration the Tyndale New Testament, the Coverdale Bible, the Matthews Bible, the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible and even the Reims New Testament. Seven years later, in 1611, these first King James Bibles came off the printing press and one was chained to every pulpit in England. A year later, printing began on smaller versions so that individuals could have a personal copy for themselves. The Anglican Church's King James Bible took decades to overcome the Geneva Bible as the most popular translation in England. It's something of an irony that many Protestant Christian churches today hold so tightly to the King James Bible as the only legitimate English language translation, even though it wasn't strictly a Protestant translation. It was printed to compete with the Geneva Bible by authorities who, throughout most of history, were hostile to Protestants and killed them. Even after England broke from Roman Catholicism in the 1500s, the Church of England continued to persecute Protestants throughout the 1600s. One famous example of this is John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress while in prison for the crime of preaching the gospel. It was persecution of Christians by the Church of England throughout the 1600s that led to many Englishmen fleeing across the Atlantic to start with new religious freedom in America. I highlight the fact that the Church of England is so close to the Catholic system with the monarch of England replacing the Pope because in our time we have seen, and I believe will continue to see, an increasing friendliness between the two and a rejoining of the two systems. 
In 2010, the Pope visited Britain for the first time in 28 years and was given the hospitality of the Church of England for the first time in history. We'll probably see more of that kind of thing in times to come. I also point it out for the sake of my fellow Scots, as this issue is a part of our spiritual heritage. Although England never had a true reformation and only left Catholicism because of Henry VIII's divorce, Scotland, led by John Knox, did have a true reformation and were filled with an incredible zeal for God. Therefore, when King James VI's son, Charles I, came to Scotland in an attempt to impose his headship and the Anglican system on Scots, they rejected it and instead created a document called the National Covenant. This covenant was between the Scottish people and God and declared that they would be wholly devoted to him alone. In response to this, Charles tried to invade Scotland twice to impose Anglicanism by force, but was soundly beaten each time. The Scots were determined to retain their religious freedom. The Covenanters often had to meet in secret to avoid persecution during this time and hundreds were killed, mostly by hanging, although many were shot during raids on prayer meetings. The last of the Covenanter martyrs was James Rennick, who was hanged on the 17th of February 1688 in Grassmarket Square, Edinburgh. His head and hands were then severed and placed over the gates of the city. The Men of Covenant by Reverend Alexander Smelly describes him like this. It was the 17th of February 1688 when James Rennick was martyred. Before the year was out, the Stuarts were in exile and persecutions was closed. He died as the herald of a more gracious day. He was of old Knox's principles, his adversaries said, when they noted his unassailable steadfastness. But we may take our farewell of him in words which were written by one who loved him dearly. When I speak of him as a man, none more comely in features, none more prudent, none more heroic in spirit, yet none more meek, more humane than condescending. He learned the truth and counted the cost, and so sealed it with his blood. The King James Bible turned out to be an excellent and accurate translation, and it became the most printed book in the history of the world, and the only book with one billion copies in print. In fact, it had no rivals for over 250 years. It had taken the deaths of thousands of reformers to win the spiritual battle, but in the end their efforts were met with triumph, and it would be of benefit for millions of souls in the generations to come. Catholic control of the information flow was broken and people can now finally read the Bible in their own language. And that's the main reason I wanted to explore the development of the Bible in this level of detail. The story of the struggle highlights the importance of the flow of information in the spiritual war. Notice how hard Satan fought to keep control of it. Knowledge is power. Satan tried to establish a hierarchy of knowledge that would create a dependency on the corrupt Catholic priests. The priests at the top of the pyramid could then control the ignorant masses for their own purposes and keep them in ignorance. Human beings could be reduced to puppets of the hierarchy, taught what to believe and how to behave. This is repeated in all occult systems. A mass of muggles controlled by an informed elite who are controlled very often without even realising it. You see, controlling people must start with controlling what they believe, because that will dictate their actions. So notice how hard Satan battled to oppose freedom of thought and free speech to keep control of the channels of information. Notice how he used the Catholic Church to tell people what they should think and then used ignorance to keep people blinded, deceived and in chains. Notice how he enforced the situation with fear, intimidation and violence to eliminate anyone who stepped out of line and who opposed him. You may also notice the same double-pronged approach of manipulation and intimidation creeping back into our society today. As darkness encroaches in our time, our laws are changing to eliminate truly free thought and speech. We now have hate that would prohibit Christians from speaking the truth. Stories are mounting of Christians being arrested for making public claims about God in the West. Political correctness aims to put a straitjacket on what we're allowed to say. This is coming in because Satan wants to control the information flow, what people hear and what they see. The primary flow of information in our society and in our time is the media, and if Satan can control that, then he can create a homogenized group of puppets who believe the same things and consequently behave the same way. Howard Zinn, historian and author, says, if those in charge of our society, politicians, corporate executives and owners of the press and television can dominate our ideas, they will be secure in their power. They will not need soldiers patrolling the streets, we will control ourselves.
We'll get to the media later, but if we dare to think differently from the crowd and unplug ourselves from the system, standing for godly truth, we will then be met with intimidation of one kind or another. It's guaranteed. Plan A will control the masses, but for Christians who have access to the truth and are brave enough to speak against it, Satan will resort to Plan B. Christians should look to the bravery of the reformers who didn't bow to the intimidation and who remain steadfast, willing to give up their lives for the truth. They were willing to risk and lose their lives to fight the information war, to be salt and light. The fear and intimidation didn't work on them and it shouldn't work on us. We shouldn't be afraid to stand up in public for God for fear of being marginalised or persecuted or losing our social standing or being made a scandal of. It is estimated that only 2% of Christians in America now share their faith with others. With statistics like that, it seems we aren't even engaging in the information war. Satan is simply advancing unchallenged and Christians are increasingly being pushed back into the margins of society. At some point we will be forced to take a stand and say enough is enough, but how strong will Satan's position be by then and how weak will ours be? The sooner we stand up and speak for Christ in our culture, the better it will be. We have to be willing to challenge the mob with moral courage despite the perceived consequences. We have to be willing to be the Jesus freak in the school or the office and to stop learning how to be cultural chameleons. As the reformers show, if we take a stand, we will win. The Christians carrying the message will be persecuted and killed because that's what happens in a spiritual war as well as a physical war. Satan will attack. The reformers were killed but because of their moral courage they succeeded in their plan to break the Catholic stronghold and to get the word of God into the hands of the people. The Covenanters were killed but because of their moral courage they succeeded in keeping Scotland free of religious tyranny. Jesus' disciples were mostly all killed but because of their moral courage the gospel spread like wildfire around the world. We need to rediscover some of that adventurous, courageous, defiant mentality if we are to have any success because if we endure, the kingdom of God will prevail. History proves it time and time again. The question is, will we be courageous enough to stand up and speak up like our predecessors or will we shrink back? In Revelation 21.8, the first to be thrown into the lake of fire are the cowardly. So let us be strong and very courageous. In other words, getting on the front foot to fight the information war with the sword of truth that is the word of God. In future parts we're going to look at the media and education system to see how Satan looks to control the flow of information in those fields. We can then think about ways to engage in the information war knowing one thing, that wherever there is a free exchange of ideas, particularly where those ideas pertain to Jesus, Satan will try to shut it down, either through manipulation or intimidation or both. The importance of this concept can't be overemphasized. He doesn't want the truth getting to anyone, so where he tries to shut down the flow of information, it is our job as Christians to make sure those flows are reopened and kept open. We have to get the gospel out into the public domain, any way we can and at whatever cost.